people in the session. So wanted to welcome everyone. If you look at the pinned post at the top of the chat, if you could please take a few seconds to complete the attendance form for this session. Um, this is creating abstractions to develop and modify programs. So we appreciate your attendance. Um, after you do that, there also, if you scroll up in the chat, uh, the link to the presentation that you are about to see uh, with uh, Mr. Kick. He's going to go ahead and kick it. I'm going to kick it. I'm going to try. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Um, one thing I did not anticipate during this presentation is being so exhausted because I have been in these sessions since six this morning because I'm in California time and it has been stimulating. It has been motivational, inspiring. And I have been so riveted and participatory in all the sessions that when I finally got to my session, it's a little bit uh, exhausting. But I know, as Owen Astrakhan said, when you start speaking about these ideas that you're passionate about, the time will end up flying. So I really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, I'm going to give you a little background of where we're going to be going. And as I teach, I was already asked, is it okay to have questions along the way? I love feedback along the way. I'd rather you address a question as it occurs to you rather than try to hold it and address it later when it may not be as appropriate. So please ask questions as you go. I'm going to be talking about creating abstractions to develop and modify programs. And I'm going to take a page off of uh, Brian McGee's book, who wrote a book, believe it or not, called Confessions of a Philosopher, who said that he's not going to try to reveal to you philosophy as it was developed. He tried to reveal philosophy as it was taught or as it was exposed to him. So I'm going to give you some feedback in terms of the abstractions that I've considered and developed along my 40 year teaching career and hopefully not get so old school that it will alienate people that weren't around in 1980, <laughs> but also bring you up to the modern day and, and get you into programming that hopefully will inspire you and inspire your students as well. All so, right, so go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Um, just wanted to remind you all to see the presentation. You can double click on that window and it will enlarge it. The sessions are being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. And just so you know, if you don't know who this is, this is Mr. Richard Kick, a math and computer, math is life, math and computer science teacher from Newberry Park High School um, in California. Uh, he's taught AP computer science using several different languages <laughs> way back, Pascal, C++, Java, of course. Um, he's worked as a C++ programmer at the Fermi National Acceler Accelerator <laughs> Laboratory, um, and as well as uh, served on the college board as an exam reader, table leader, question leader, everybody's leader, computer science <laughs> development committee member for the APCSA, APCS, AB, APCSP, um, just very extraordinary human being as quoted from Mrs. Lynn Diaz. There you go, I hand it all over to you now. So as always, you have been incredibly kind and I will just give you a shout out right off the bat. I've been with you in so many sessions all through the day and your support and your interaction in the chat has been incredibly helpful. So I thank you in advance again for all you're about to do and all you have already done. My pleasure. So, Thank you. Um, so I have been writing not just software for probably 45, 50 years, but I have been writing a program for over 30 years. And that's the program I wanna to discuss today. And I always emphasize to my students that I know there's a company out there called Microsoft that started writing this little program called Microsoft Word in the 1980s. And I always ask my students, what year did they finish Word? And they all realize they've never finished Word there are always ways to increase and improve the functionality, the ease of use, the interfaces, and that's the spirit of this discussion that I would like to carry forward. Um, I'm going to look at a particular problem that I think is something that all your students could embrace, uh, they could understand, and they could actually enjoy. 
but yet it will become as complex as you would like to uh, allow your students to explore. So we're going to talk about adding abstractions to facilitate communication with the computer. How do you talk to the computer? If you have very few abstractions, we call that low level programming and it can be very difficult. I am going to help go through this historical perspective of how I built abstractions to make it hopefully simpler and simpler to talk to the computer about what I wanted it to do. Yet writing the abstractions became more and more complex. So we talked to our students about that balance between the use of abstraction, which is easier, and the creation of more complex abstractions, which becomes difficult. So we want to help them understand that balance or the trade-offs that we always hear about in computer science. And I also want to emphasize the perspectives that I constantly gain for others. Those uh, perspectives that, yes, today actually inspired me to add a slide during Owen Astrakhan's presentation. So one of my slides came straight from Owen, so or at least his ideas, so constantly being inspired by my uh, fellow educators. So let's go to the, and by the way, the contact information is down there, I'll, uh, and also the bit.ly uh, URL is there so that if you do want to uh, follow along with your own uh, version of the slides, you can access them online. So when I go to the next slide, this is the part that I always um, somewhat challenging is I have to find my slides. There we go. And I go to the next slide and I ask you all to look at that and tell me about the abstraction associated with that image. And I'll go a little deeper and make sure that we all kind of agree on what an abstraction is, a generalization technique that ignores or hides detail to capture some kind of commonality. That's straight from Wiktionary. And there is a relatively famous definition. The essence of abstraction is preserving information that is relevant in a given context and forgetting information that is irrelevant in that context. So what I've always talked about that was further emphasized by Owen Astrakhan this, this, just this morning, so here's my slide. Abstraction is the process of reducing complexity by focusing on the main idea. That's straight from the current course and exam description from AP Computer Science Principles, which Owen Astrakhan was one of the parents. He was one of the creators of that course, along with our very famous Lynn Diaz. So thank you to both of them. And my definition that I usually informally use with my students is an abstraction is a simplification of a concept or process. So as Owen mentioned, it's a noun or a verb that reduces complexity in order to facilitate communication. In particular, I want to talk to the computer. And if I actually had to, every time I wanted the computer to do something, go through all of the complexities of how the actual computer does it, it would exhaust me more than I'm already exhausted. So instead, what I will do is create these abstractions which may not be simple to create, but once I have them, or once I can use abstractions created by someone else, it helps to ease the communication. It facilitates that communication between the programmer and the computer. So what I would like you to do is look at that image again and attempt to name these abstractions, otherwise known as these concepts, these simplifications, that we all know involve much more detail and much more complexity, but there are certain concepts out here that you might be able to better see now, or maybe in a math classroom typically presented more like this. I would like you to go and look at that particular image and click on the link at the bottom. Now, this is where I have to check to verify. Can you see that image and the link associated with that image? And is it possible to put that in the chat so that people can actually click on it if they don't have access to the slides? Oh, my goodness, that was quick. Thank you very much. So what I would like you to do is take a couple minutes and go to the Google form that I have there and just participate by typing in any concepts, any words, any ideas, any processes that you think are associated with that image. What are the abstractions based on that particular slide? And now we'll take a minute or two. 
and I'll look in the chat window for anybody who says, yes, I've already recorded this. And you guys can see what I'm doing. I actually can see the summary of what people are entering as you enter it. I don't know about you, but I am still constantly amazed by the technological advancements that have taken place while I've been teaching over these last 40 years. And I am just in awe of what we are doing right now. I am seeing you, wherever you are in the world, typing this information that we can all share together. This is an amazing educational world. So triangles, dots, colors, primary colors, triangle, RGB, equidistant. These are all concepts that we know have much more complexity than we could probably have time to discuss. But because we've created these abstractions like triangle, we can just use that term to facilitate our conversation without having to go through all the details of explaining what a triangle really is or explaining what a, real, a primary color is. That could be quite a discussion. A drawing, circle, face, color, location, all of these wonderful ideas. And hopefully you guys have the link that you could, I think at this point, simply add to, but I could probably do a capture and put that on one of my slides. I'll give you a summary of what we've come up with. And I apologize if you didn't get a chance to actually contribute, but hopefully you can in the future before I put that summary out. And I'll go back to view, the presentation view. And now I'll ask, how have I changed that abstraction? And you'd probably mention that there's an additional dot. It's a different shape. Now we have another additional dot, another different shape. And now we have a lot of dots. And you'll notice that as we get to more and more dots, you see that it becomes closer and closer to this concept that we typically talk about, typically in math classes, called a circle. And so I have arbitrarily said, I'm going to just stop my abstraction at 20 points, because beyond 20 points, it's going to be very similar. It's still going to be circular generally in nature. So there's the abstractions that we've begun our discussion with. And I go back and I go to the next slide. And I see a game that was exposed to me in 1988 by a gentleman named Heinz Otto Peitken from Germany. He came into a NCTM presentation, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and talked about this relatively simple game. And then into the 1990s, I met a person named Robert Devaney, who did a presentation at Lake Forest College in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and he talked about this game. So you can read this and understand what the rules are, and I'll just generally summarize that the chaos game is all about starting with initial points, and we're just going to start with those initial three and associate each point with a random number. Let's just, because we're in computer science, call them zero, one, and two. And now I would ask someone in the chat to type a number, either zero, one, or two. And the first one that I see is the one that I'm going to use. I saw two, fantastic. Both John and Laura agree, that's fantastic. So I look at this, and if I arbitrarily start at the red dot, that's dot zero, and then this is dot one in the bottom left and dot two in the bottom right, I can see, and let me, let me hear that, let me have you tell me, can you see my cursor on the slide? Audible, anybody? You cannot see my cursor? Well, I'll just talk through where my now, cursor now, is. Yes. It's delayed. Oh, you did see the cursor. I saw a black cursor, but it was a little delayed. Okay, excellent. So is my cursor currently pointing to the red dot? Yes. Uh, okay, excellent. So because John and Laura generated a two randomly, what the game asks me to do is move towards the dot, which is associated with the two, but only go halfway. 
And so now when you see my cursor here, you'd say that would be the next dot you would plot, and that is called the last, the most recent dot plotted. Now I'm going to go back into the chat again and ask you one more time, give me another number between 0 and 2, and integer only, please. So the first one I saw is 1. So I go back to my slide. And because I'm here with the most recent plot, and now the green dot is associated with the one, I'm going to go from this most recent dot plotted towards the green dot halfway. And so now where my cursor is, is the second dot. And I just continue this process of generating a random number, associating it with one of the three dots, and then moving towards that dot, but only halfway from the last dot plotted towards the vertex. So at this point, does anyone have any questions about what the game requires you to do? Are there any chat window comments that you would like me to address before we move forward? So my wait time in classroom would be a little different than chat room wait time. But in this case, I'm going to now go to the slide that says, now go ahead and play the game yourself. And when I ask you to play the game, I'm going to go to what is called a Jamboard, which is relatively new to me. And again, I'm absolutely enjoying this use of technology. Notice that we have two people on this Jamboard. And if you click the little arrow on the top, you go to another Jamboard and another Jamboard. I would like you guys to just find a Jamboard. And if you can't find one, hopefully you put your name on it and say, OK, I'll edit it for everybody looking at this Jamboard. What I would like you to do is take the pen, assuming that we just went through what was just discussed, go through, I would suggest using the highlighter because I think it's easier to mark than all the others. And I'll just arbitrarily pick black dots. I'll try to emulate what was just discussed. Go halfway between the zero and the two, put a dot. Go halfway between that dot and the green and put a dot. And what I'd like you to do is draw what you think the actual game will generate if you played that thousands or millions of iterations. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes. And you could look at other jam boards. You could just stay on one and look at your own. But see if you can just draw on one of the jam boards or observe the people drawing on the jam board what you think the actual figure will look like. And please, in the chat window, if anybody has any questions or comments, let me know, and I'll try to further explain what I am expecting with the Jamboard drums. All right. So while they're doing that, we did have a question. Is there an online version to demo live for the students? So I don't know if you're actually about to get to that using a Jamboard or something. So if you saw the slides, and I know there are always some people that love to look ahead, everything I'm doing here is online. And everything that I ask you to hand draw is going to be automated. And I'm going to show you how I automated it over the last 30 years using very different languages and very different computers. So all of this you should be able to not only do in an automated way, you should be able to share with your students how they could create these same automations and do these kind of tasks all by themselves. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. And so as this is happening, I can go through the Zoom or the Jam boards, and I can see if there are any other. Oh, there we have some drawings happening. There's another. There's another. And so I can go through all the different Jam boards. Notice there's up to nine. Oh, no, there's just 10. So you could actually create Jam boards if you'd like. And look at the insight that I see over here. Mm. If someone feels like there's going to be this pattern that looks similar in shape, but seems to be reversed in terms of direction. Interesting insight. I see the dots getting drawn. See more dots. And at this point, I'm just going to tell you what I tell my students. If you have never in your life seen this before, you're probably like me and many, many other people. You probably have no idea what this is going to look like. You might have some good guesses. You might have some insight and try as one person 
was doing, kind of imagining the final outcome. But if you have never seen it before, it's incredibly difficult to do what was done here. This is amazing. Uh, let me just ask Anonymous Unicorn, did you see this before? Can you say a yes or a no? Have you ever seen this process before? Can you just write it here on the Jamboard? Here, I'll write it and you can circle it. Either yes or no. Okay. I think they're coming. I think it was yes. It looked like the Y. So, <laughs> so what that means is it looks like they drew this because they've seen this process before. And here is the exciting thing for me. I've seen this process since 1988, and I think today I'm going to see something I've never seen before. So that's what I hope will inspire your students as well, is no matter what they've seen, I'm going to show you abstractions that help you modify in such a way that we're going to create things that I have never even seen. I've been doing this for over 30 years. And I'm getting another message. message. That says, Pascal, uh, yeah, well. triangle, excellent. Definitely related to discrete mathematics, probability, and the generation of a triangle called Pascal's triangle, which in some ways are very similar, and in other ways, if we wanted to teach the mathematics of it, are very different. So it would be a great conversation to have. So I am now going to go back to our full view, and thank you very much for participating. And now as I go back to full view, I'm going to go to the next slide and say, well, instead of me drawing it, I had the computer draw it for me. And that seems kind of similar to what you guys were seeing, correct? Mm. And then I had the computer do a few more. And now I'm seeing that there does seem to be this region in which no dots are appearing. And now I'll do many, many more. And I see, wow, that insight that Anonymous Unicorn exhibited was excellent. There is a spot because of the algorithm at which it will be impossible to generate a point. But it's a little hard to see in this blurry version. So I told my computer, please don't make the dots so big. Let's make them a little smaller. And that's a very high resolution mm -hmm. image of repeating that chaos game literally hundreds of thousands of times. So as I go to the next slide, I have created abstractions that allows me to change the rules. Oops, let me go back to presentation view. And let me see if I can go to my other slide. So I have changed the rules. You guys have seen that I don't have to use the three points that the chaos game required me to do. I could use five points, and hopefully the slides are going to pick up any second now. I'm still not seeing this. Oh, I see loading. But I will just tell you that I have used abstractions to say, no longer am I obligated to use three points. I'm going to arbitrarily be able to pick any number of points between 1 and 20. And I'm not going to draw them. I'm going to have the computer draw them for me. And I'm going to show you what that abstraction looks like. Uh, do we have any optimism that these slides are going to show up in the next couple of minutes? <laughs> well, there's always hope. <laughs> <laughs> there is hope. I, I appreciate your optimism and your support. Um, you try to refresh. Oh, there you go. Oh, you see him? Excellent. So I played the chaos game, but I created abstractions to change the number of points. So now I have five. And now here is what I wanted to get to. I finally can actually create abstractions that run a program that generate this image for me. And I don't know how many people in here know what that computer screen was generated by. Uh, anybody in the chat window know where that generation came from? I gave you a hint. <laughs> Apple, we we see Apple too. 
So what actual screen was this appearing on in terms of the computer generating it? What was the computer that generated those screens? And for me, because I started teaching with an Apple II, this brought so many fond memories because that Apple II was the first computer that I taught computer science with. I wrote software and other computers, but I taught with an Apple II. And believe it or not, you can see it. This is the actual program I wrote in 1988 on an Apple II. And I was so lucky to go to an emulator that actually allows me and it allows you and your students to go back and write the software. And that's what happens when you run it. And that's what happens when you run it and change the colors. And that's what happens when you scroll down and see the other code. And here is the documentation. And here is the GitHub storage repository. And those are all things that some of us probably want to see, but most of us don't. Most of us want to go, what happened? Most of us want to go to this link. And as I go to this link, I get to this page. And that is one of the most enjoyable abstractions that I've discussed and used in quite a while. This web page, which again is on the slides, all the links are there, all of the URLs are accessible. This page allows me to put any AppleSoft basic program I would like and run it, it would actually display as though I'm running on an AppleSoft program. And notice I also have a link to this web page called Chaos Basic. And if I copy this Chaos Basic and I go back to the URL that has that emulator for an Apple II and I paste that code in, I have just written a program on a machine that was built in the late 1970s and it still runs. And if I put in three, I've just played the chaos game for thousands of points. Now your students are gonna probably say, wow, those are pretty crummy graphics and that's low res. And I think that's the entire point is at that point, abstractions were relatively low level still. That Apple II was an amazing machine, but it didn't do anything near what we do now. If I stop it and run it again and put in five, you'll see that it does the other chaos game uh, figure that I generated, which was the five point fractal. Stop it, go all the way up to 10, and now it becomes circular in general, and you can see the pattern. But this is more for people who are old and like playing with really old toys just because it's a very nice trip down memory lane. But I put it all there so that you can explore as much as you would like. But for those of you who want to move on, let's take a look at the next slide. And again, hopefully this slide is popping up on your screen. Is that good? And now I've changed the rules by making five points instead of three. But you'll also notice there's another difference in that image. Instead of moving the direction or the distance away to keep spacing between those figures, I'm still moving that halfway between one point and the other. And now these figures are overlapping. So what I would like to do is be able to change the distance that I move from the previous point plotted towards the vertex to leave more space, just like we did with the triangle using half. For this, I actually moved a different ratio. And for that one, it's very difficult to see how I generated it until you see these points. And when you see those points, you realize I didn't move half the way. I didn't move a third or two thirds of the way. I moved actually beyond the vertex one and a half times the distance from the last point plotted to the vertex. And it actually drew this image that goes beyond the original triangle. And I also had to miniaturize this so I could actually see it in a smaller scale. And before you actually start doing this and running the code and exploring yourself, I'm gonna give you a little insight because we only have an hour and this took me about 32 years. So I tell my students in education, you all could figure this out at home. Stay home, go online and you could do it yourself. 
But if you take courses, I will guide you through more efficiently and much more quickly than you could ever learn just by yourself online. So I'm gonna to try to guide you through quickly. If I move one tenth the distance, I'm only gonna get points really close to the original point. And it's gonna deviate between zero, one, and two, which means eventually when I get points in here, they're never gonna move very far out from this center and you end up getting this little section in the middle that's dense and the section out by the extremes are incredibly difficult because one tenth of the way would have to be generated with the same random number in a long string of, of numbers in order for it to actually bick to the original vertex. Here is two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, and then the five tenths you already saw. So this is six, seven, eight, nine. It gives you some intuition on how the ratio of how far you're gonna move, whether it be a half or six tenths or one tenth, changes what the figure will look like. And this is shocking to my students when they figure out that if they put a ratio of 0.01, they're gonna generate any one of three numbers, but it's going to trend towards the center and once it's in the center, it's going to be incredibly difficult for it to escape. In fractal dynamical system talk, we call these things attractors. And you could choose to talk about those or not, but I could just say, wow, this is really pretty. I like generating these kind of figures and I'm going to generate the abstractions that are going to help me do it. Here's a 1.25 ratio and here's the 1.5 ratio. So at this point, I'm gonna ask you to ask any questions you may have in the chat window for what this process of chaos game is all about, how we're gonna generate it, and then we're actually gonna to go to another web page where you're gonna take the code, paste it into a location that was provided to us by a computer science educator who's been incredible, has a strong impact on my career. And we're gonna be actually using this to generate our own images. So does anybody have any questions on what this is doing so far? Okay, I actually click on this link. And when I click on the link, it brings up this page, which is, oops, I guess I have to escape out and brings up this page, which is here. There it is called the chaos in JavaScript. Now, if I'm gonna switch from AppleSoft Basic in 1988 to JavaScript in the 90s, it's gonna take probably a lot more work because the environment is much more robust. It allows me to do much more complicated uh, manipulation of the screen. And so I had to generate many more abstractions. But what Nick Parlante at Stanford University did is he gave me this environment that you'll find at the top of this page called the Chaos JavaScript, which he called introcomputing.org. So I go to that introcomputing.org and I take any window and I just paste in that code. And that's the entire program that I just gave you from that text window. And what Nick did is said, if you wanna make a simple image, just say new simple image in that abstraction, that concept model of what is a digital image was given to me by his program. So if you go to introcomputing.org and say, I want a new simple image, and you give it a name of an image that he has on his server at Stanford University, it will generate the image. If it says loading, it may need to run again, you simply click it again, and this time it will load. It has to have the time to load from that server at Stanford. And here I am hundreds of miles away. You are probably even more than hundreds of miles away, and you could still get it to display on your machine. So at this point in the chat window, how many people have successfully on Nick Parlante's introcomputing.org site generated a fractal image? How many people, just by a yes, there's one, how many people, there's two. And here's what I tell my students. Computer science is typically not a race. You don't have to be the fastest or the first one to generate it. As a matter of fact, 
many computer scientists spend a lot of hours just enjoying the creation and the manipulation process. So it's great that you're first, but if you do this three hours from now, or you do this tomorrow morning, as long as you have that experience of grabbing that code, pasting it in and getting it to generate it, that's great. So, so far, at least I have at least three, four people that are generating this, but please don't for your students, make this into a speed competition. Make it into a, as soon as you get it to work, that is an incredible moment for you personally. You have created something that I, when I started creating, when I started writing this in 1980 something, would have never imagined I had the potential to do that. And now I think all your, your students will be able to do that. So now that we've done it, let's go back to the slides and look at the abstractions associated with it. Now I'm gonna to try to make this text bigger so it's a little easier to read on your screen. And I can now see that not only can I make an image, I can also tell it how many vertices I want. So I have a max number of vertices is 20. The number of vertices I'm actually using for this particular image is three. So by creating these abstractions, I can very easily change it to four. Uh, my, my window has to be short enough that I can actually see the run button. So I shorten it up a little bit and I click run. That's what the chaos game would generate if I told it to do four points and now change it to five points. And now it's becoming those familiar figures that I've already seen. If you don't like how long it takes, notice there's a max iterations, which means how many times do you generate the random number and actually plot the point? Just take off an order of magnitude, take off a zero. Notice it runs much faster, but it's not as pretty. So you have to have compromise. Maybe I'll put it up to 30,000 and now it's way faster, but it's still a little lighter than if I generated the full 100,000. And if I change this all the way up to 20, you'll notice it's a relatively circular pattern. So if that's where we stopped, for me, that was pretty fun back in the 80s, but we needed more abstractions to actually manipulate this in the full methods that I wanted to. So I actually abstracted out the plot ratio and said, let's be able to change that plot ratio easily, quickly. So if I change that plot ratio to 0.75, Notice that image becomes, in my opinion, much more interesting. If I change it to 0.85, the more I move, the more space that I create between the vertices and the more distinct these patterns become. And if I change it to 0.05, that's where it tends to go towards the center and just create this blob. And if I do 0.005, this was one of the coolest ones I've ever done. I was so excited when I discovered that this happens. But don't forget that you can encourage your students to actually explore beyond one and go 1.5 and immediately recognize that that doesn't look real appealing because I'm not within the window that will display it. So I put in another abstraction I change the magnification. So if I only do four tenths of the total width of the viewing area for the original figure, notice now I can see that four tenths and I can see beyond it better. And if I change this to point two, notice I can see that the original circle was probably in here and now I'm going beyond it 1.5. Not real exciting. If I try 1.9, it's again, much bigger. So I actually have to make it smaller and run it. And this constant trade-off of what do I want it to look like? How do I want it to look? Is all now manipulable by using these abstractions that I've created. Instead of saying, write the code to make the picture show up, I use Nick Parlante's new simple image and it just magically appears. Instead of writing code to plot a bunch of vertices, I just say, you tell me how many vertices you want and it will actually plot it for you. If you say, I don't like a plot ratio of 1.9, I can change it to 1.2. 
and it very quickly draws a much more interesting figure. And if I want to magnify it back up to 0.6, I can make it larger. So I'm hopeful that students will so far be kind of enthralled by the fact that they can use these abstractions to generate the kind of images that hopefully they haven't seen before and are kind of appealing. I'll just briefly, because we only have about 35 minutes left, I'll briefly go through some of the abstractions that I would encourage you and your students to actually manipulate. This is an abstraction that generates the color. So if you have a color, which is an array of vertices colors, you simply say, if I have 20 colors, I'll do an array of 20, 0 through 19. And you can probably guess what these numbers are for. So if I go into the chat window, can somebody tell me what those actual numbers are representing? RGB is exactly correct. Now, if you've discussed this in your course, your students are familiar with that abstraction. I doubt that I or any of they could describe what really happens to produce color on a computer, but I'll bet you they know the abstraction red, green, and blue, and by putting in those numbers into those slots, they can generate color because they're using an abstraction, not creating the abstraction that requires them to know what color is. So that's what the entire thing is. Um, when you say you are fast, is that a comment saying I'm going too fast? For uh, Laura Gray, <laughs> who responded. Because I am really sensitive. <laughs> yeah, in class, I'd be sensitive to cues that says, hey, slow down or speed up. In a virtual environment, I realize how little time we have to do a lot. So I'm just trying to lay out as much as I can in the time. But if you'd rather me slow down and repeat things, please let me know and I'd be happy to do so. No, your speed is I go good. Back to the, the excellent. Thank you. Um, notice the abstractions are strewn throughout this code. And here's what I emphasize to my students. Even if you've never seen JavaScript before, even if you've never written a program, I can highlight that blue section of code and ask you all, what does that code do? In the chat window. Okay, so you did have a couple of questions prior to that. And one asked, um, how is the color table okay. considered an abstraction? And then uh, that was from David Tereski. And then we have from Leonardo Alvarez, how do you kind of cue students to explain abstractions without giving them the answer? So what I do is start off with a discussion of cookies. And I ask students, what's a cookie? And they will almost always say, well, it's some kind of file on the computer. And I said, no, 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 no. What's a cookie? Like when you're growing up, what's a cookie? And if you were here live, I'd ask you to speak. But if I ask you to type what's a cookie, you very quickly find out you have no idea what a cookie is. Because as you start telling people what a cookie is, you start figuring out how incredibly complex a cookie is. Does somebody want to be bold? Yeah, I like the young. And tell me in the chat window, what is a cookie? So this will be my little classroom simulation. If I ask my students, what is a cookie? And they gave me feedback, I will show you how I would lead them down to the next step of better understanding and abstraction. What is a cookie? It's a treat. So that means it's something that I give my dog that he gnaws on for a year and a half. No, that's a dog treat. So as soon as you say treat, that's an abstraction that doesn't capture what a cookie is. So now tell me what a cookie is again. Info that follows around the internet. And I say, that's awesome. If we were talking about computer cookies, but we're talking about food cookies, things you eat, a sweet flour-based snack. And so I always bring up my mother who used to make these chocolate coconut things that she'd stick on wax paper and stick in the freezer. And then when we pulled them out, we ate them and we called them cookies. Are those cookies? Because they had no flour in them. A baked good, the freezer was never baked. So if it's not baked, is it no longer a cookie? 
baked dough, what goes into the dough. You know what, all these are legitimate. And I would tell my students, you should have these questions. You should have these discussions. And now you should have insight into how difficult the concept of cookie is. So what do we do? We said, let's forget about all the possible ingredients and all the methods of preparation. And let's just say we agree that this cookie is this food item that we are familiar with and now we're gonna remove all that detail just so we can have a conversation about cookies. Hey, do you guys want me to bring some cookies tomorrow? Yay, everybody's happy. That would have been so incredibly difficult to discuss if I would have said, hey, would you like to take some flour and some sugar and some peanut butter and some oatmeal, because those are my cookies, and put these all together with some egg and some milk? It would take us so long and instead, I'm going to use this abstraction or this simplification, this reduction of complexity, just call it a cookie, agree on the generalities. It's a sweet treat that I'm going to bring in to eat. And that's the only details I need to worry about in order for you to get cookies tomorrow. And that's the purpose of abstraction, to facilitate the communication about complex concepts. So, and I'm sorry about the hunger. I skipped lunch for this, but I will get my, my food after this. How about now comparing that to computer science? If you had to flip all the bits and do all the memory manipulation like we used to do on the Apple II, we'd type in commands and it would change memory locations and make things happen. It was a blast, but it was exhausting. If you had to do all those things to get the computer to do what you needed it to do, you would not be able to accomplish much in a little in a long period of time. So instead, what you say is, let's make simplifications. This highlighted piece of code I have, it just looks like a big mess of text. But I claim that almost every one of you at a glance can probably tell what that abstraction does. Does someone want to give a guess as to what that chunk of code does? You're still focused on dinner time. Can you guys, when I magnify this, see that it's magnified or does it still look small on your screen? Okay, I'm trying to see because you know it's delayed. Oh, and now it's, I messed up the view. Sorry about that. So I will tell you that I highlighted the word set vertices. vertices yeah. And if I look at all that code, I can pretty much look at the first word at the top and say, or the second word at the top and say, oh, that sets the vertices. I don't have to think about how it does it. I don't have to think about why it does it. I can simply say, I now have program code that if I say set vertices, my vertices will magically appear. Now the question will be, how many vertices? That's my other abstraction. I have a variable says number of vertices. And when I say set vertices, it will set exactly that many. That's what you tell students they're generating code for. They're creating abstractions so that they can facilitate problem solving without having to worry about all those details. Does that answer your question? Whomever asked it? And I, again, could go through and talk about many, many other abstractions like I can get the dimensions of the window, but I don't care about the details of JavaScript and Canvas elements and widths and heights. I just say, hey, get the dimensions. I have them. I can change the entire image, which was a very cute picture of Nick Parlante's daughter, and I just changed it all white pixels so I would have some canvas on which I can draw. I can draw the pixels. How does that chaos game draw the pixels? I don't really care at this point. I use that abstraction to say, draw pixels and they will show up on the screen. So that's what I would encourage your students to do is from a high level abstraction perspective, look at code, identify what we in JavaScript call functions, which advanced placement computer science principles calls 
user-defined abstractions and use those user-defined abstractions to actually now further modify what the program does simply by calling those abstractions. And Nick Parlante supplied a lot of abstractions for me, like getting that new simple image, like print, which at the very bottom says, if you print, it will just magically make the image appear. Believe me, it's much more difficult to make an image appear on a web page than just print. But Nick wrote the abstraction that I now can call and it magically does it for me. So at this point, we've gone through two levels of abstraction creation. I wrote for an Apple II back in the 80s and I just got it to do those simple images. And then I wrote for Nick Parlante's Intro Computing where I could use his abstractions without dealing all, with all the details of JavaScript and web page development. And now I'm gonna ask us all to look at the third stage, which going back to my slides. We had a question, are there other libraries that you can call? So, Anybody who is writing software for a living is using multiple libraries. And we in education have to choose libraries that are going to be most appropriate for our students. And if you use professional libraries, I know earlier someone said if you use professional development tools like Eclipse, it is my opinion that you will totally intimidate and, and totally blow your students away. So if you start looking at professional libraries, the level of understanding required is pretty much beyond the intro student level. So what I look for are those libraries created by educators for other educators. And Nick Parlante at Stanford University created this introcomputing.org, which he has very accurately uh, laid out. He has defined all of the tools that are available and he will allow you to use those to write your own software. So I would suggest going to introcomputing.org and just reading his pages and you'll see the kind of things you can use. And again, very well displayed, very well developed. And he basically does what Mark Guzdal, Barger Erickson emphasize as media computation, letting students write software to create and manipulate images. It tends to be highly motivational for your students. That's why I'm doing this. My students tend to like to write software to make pretty pictures rather than what we used to do, make a business table of people's taxes and print out a bunch of rows of text. That's very valuable stuff. It's just research has shown that the media computation is more motivational. So go to these educational sites and look at the libraries those educators define for you. And now I'm gonna go to this next level of sitting with my grandsons and them saying, you know, that's fun that you can change the points and that's fun that you can change how big or small it is. Can you flip it upside down? And I said, no. And they said, well, I want to flip it upside down. And I said, no. <laughs> and like grandsons often do, they said, yes, I do want it upside down. So I had to write another abstraction. So I decided to write another page called the Chaos HTML JavaScript. I've moved to an entirely new world of program development. So I go back to my slides. Oops. I go back to my window that doesn't have my slides. I go to the third page called HTML JavaScript. I just had it and now I lost it. Where is it? If you have noticed, all of this is coming from my website that I use to teach. So if you, like me, get lost, you can always go back to computer science principles and you can always go to these resources. And I have developed resources over the, the years for computer science principles. In all this, I stuck under the concept of abstraction. So I have the chaos basic, which is that page that shows you how to get to the Apple II. I have the chaos JavaScript, which shows you how to get to Nick Parlante's page and get to that code and paste it in. And now I'm going to chaos HTML and JavaScript, which ironically, I don't see listed here. So I apologize, I will put it on. It's this page here. So I will simply click on that URL. 
or better yet, copy it, paste it. It's in the chat. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. And so there's the third page, which I have to add to my AKB Computer Science Principles page. So one thing you probably notice about these abstractions is, number one, the code got much longer. Number two, I'm no longer in Nick Parlante's website, which was a nice, comfortable place to do things really quickly because he gave me a bunch of abstractions. I am now in full-blown HTML slash JavaScript where I make a web page, and in that web page, I write the code to do all of the manipulations myself. That is not something you want students to start off doing. But if I now make a new tab, actually, if I simply go to a text editor, and the text editor I use is called brackets. I assume at this point you can see it. Is that correct? You could use on a Windows machine, WordPad, and save it as text only. You on a Macintosh could use text edit and save it as text only. But once I get into this editor, I say file, save as, and then I make sure I name it something.html. In this case, I called it chaos.html. All right, we still see the Google search. Oh, you are not seeing my brackets. So I will get out of there. I will stop sharing. And then I will start sharing again. And I believe when I start sharing again, it should allow me to show you brackets. So right. I'll share right. my screen. I'll show my application window. In this case, I'm going to find brackets. And I know there's a little delay. Let me know if you can see it. I think we're good. We're saying okay. a lot of code. Yeah, this is just a text editor. So all of that that you take from that page, copy and paste, is one large abstraction called the chaos game. I've written a program in a web page using JavaScript. So when kids say, I just want to make my own web page, say, OK. But now you have to use all of the abstractions given in JavaScript. And that requires much more coding. So I encourage my students to stay in the introcomputing.org while they're developing because those abstractions are built specifically so a student with no background and no experience can have success right away. But I try to get as many of my students as I possibly can to get to this level, which means now there's this little lightning bolt on brackets. Or you could simply go to, and again, I'll stop sharing. I'll start sharing again, just a regular old web page. So I go to this web page, and you can see that text again. And if I simply say, open up the code called chaos.html that I think I put in Georgia Tech. And I don't have it. It's here somewhere, I guarantee you. If I save it and then open it up, I'll just show you what you're going to see. You're going to see cancel out. You're going to see this web page. Is it you can't see that web page, or do I have to reshare and unshare? We're still seeing uh, your website. Okay, so I'll go back, share the window, boom. Okay, while you're doing that, there was a question about um, rubrics, rubrics that you would use to evaluate your student abstractions. And this is from Leonardo Alvarez. Rubrics to evaluate students at, oh, for abstractions. So I will often have students do Google Docs and explain a computer science abstraction that they've used to write software. And at the lowest level, I encourage them to say a variable is an abstraction, an expression is an abstraction, a function is an abstraction. So I would have a rubric that says, if you can name any concept you've used to write software, functions, expressions, variables, you now understand the concept of abstraction. But then what I try to do is get them to develop their own abstraction. So if I say, now I need you to write a function that will calculate whatever your favorite mathematical calculation is. They write the function, my calculation, open and close parentheses. 
and then do a calculation and then return that number, I say, if you can do that, you now have earned points for creating a student generated abstraction, which is very similar to what the Advanced Placement Computer Science Principles course requires students to do. How do you generate your own abstraction? Then I tell them, if it's a single line of mathematical calculation, it's not complex enough to receive credit for the AP. So I will say, is there any multiple step abstraction that you would want to create? And then we start talking about algorithms. And so my rubric would require them to do a multiple step computation that then when they call it, performs that for them so that they no longer have to write the code to accomplish that task, they can simply call it. So the rubric goes from as low level as just identify abstractions you're using all the way up to create an abstraction, use it by calling it, and then write one that's complex enough that would allow me to say this is a multiple step abstraction that would also give them credit for the algorithm requirement for the AP computer science principles. Awesome. So if I now go back to this website, I now see that all the abstractions have been created by JavaScript within this web page. And this is where for me, it becomes really fun for students they have to write the code, it's very hard, but if they can get to this level, now I can simply click on a page and it just drew 10,000 points. And if I change this so that I want four vertices and I click, it now draws on top of that instead of removing it, four. And if I click again, it draws 10,000 more points. If I reload my page after it draws my 10,000 points, if I reload my page, notice that my, my grandson's request to make it go upside down was granted by the creation of this abstraction. Can you orient the vertices in different ways? Right now, this is what I'm calling zero degrees. What if I change it to 90 degrees? I now can draw that same fractal with the zero vertex to the far right, the two vertex towards the bottom, and the one vertex at the top. And of course, if I change this to 180, my grandson's wish was granted. It's now a fractal that's upside down. And I had to complete it by doing 270. And now I have a complete symmetric figure. And I started having the time of my life. And I hope you also, especially if you've never done fractal generation, could use this code and explore and better yet, look at the abstractions and see if you want to use them differently than I did and start generating things that I didn't even imagine. So if I go back to my slides and I go back to present mode, I see that I kind of showed you what I've explored. Those are some of the things I just did with my grandsons who just came to visit me for the first time in about three or four months. And here are the rotations and the reductions and the generations of multiple fractions. Here's my grandson saying, I'm gonna just change the magnification by a 10th over and over and watch that thing expand from the center. This is one I generated that I've generated for years, but I'd never then generated one that fit just inside. Mathematically calculating what that ratio has to be was kind of fun. And then one just inside of that, and I thought, this is a whole new level. And of course, the abstraction I immediately thought is, I need to iterate my fractals. Do you want it's us to fun. see your presentation? Because you still had your presentation screen, your slides. Are you back showing your slides? Got to share. Yeah. I am yeah. so sorry. Stop sharing and start sharing again. I apologize. See, I told you, you are invaluable. Okay, there's my slides. Hey. So if I go back to view, now you can see them, right? So I can rotate the images. I can put images inside images. Here are the ones that are just magnified by an extra tenth, so it looks like expanding out from the center. Here is the large fractal and a small one inside. Again, mathematically calculating what those ratios has to be, or simply through experimentation. So you just 
have this combination of pure mathematics and practical experimental mathematics doing iterations and creating approximations and then learning the mathematics from that experience rather than just purely always trying to learn the abstractions and doing the abstract computation. So again, all of this is on slides that you can get access to. They're all pasted on websites that the URLs are given. And I'll leave you with this. When I go to the next coordinate, who said that I have to go linearly from the next vertex, from the previous vertex, why just go on a straight line segment some fraction of that total distance? Why not start using curve paths? So now I can start using these sine curves that now to get from one point to the other will start to distort what the figure looks like. Why not start trying other periodis, periodic uh, functions to see if I can make some really cool patterns. I have done this for 32 years, or at least 32 years, and there are things that I generate every time I explore this that I've never seen before. And I hope that's the same spirit that you give to your students. Last night, literally, I walked outside, took a picture, and I saw the chaos game. These look like the vertices of my original triangle, and these are the iterations. And I thought, that's what I want my students to do. Look up to the stars, reach for the stars, program in a, with a feeling of limitlessness. You can generate anything your imagination has ever conjured through the use of software techniques. So inspire your students to explore, create, and most importantly, I think, enjoy, have fun. So at this point, I will leave it up for him just like Owen did for all the questions that we have time for. All right, so yeah, we still have about six minutes left for the session. So if you have any questions. Teachers are snapping their fingers. This is what we used to do in the classroom all the time. <laughs> ah, thank you very much. That. Good to see those familiar names and the new names. It's a great group of people, this whole, by the way, workshop, the Constellations workshop has been just an incredible experience. Very much enjoyed it. Mm, well, thank you. Wait, the reason it's been enjoyable is because of presenters as yourself. So, And facilitators uh, like you <laughs> have made my job. Can you imagine if you weren't here, what a crash and burn moment I would have had about multiple times? So hey. thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Any other questions or comments or suggestions on how maybe you will use that that I didn't even think of? Hmm. I have Google Drive with all the materials. So the slides are all on Google Drive. All of the code are on those web pages whose URLs are given. And if you ever think of something that you wanted that you couldn't find, let me know and I can email it or I could give you the URL to the spot where you should be able to find it. I will put that extra link on my computer science principles page as well. Oh, and you are so good. The attendance form, very nice. Thank you for reminding them. Mm -hmm. Do I put it, do I have to fill out that attendance form? No, sir. We, Thank you very you much. You were here, you're a presenter. <laughs> I filled gotcha. all my good ones out, but I don't have to fill this one out. And if Leonardo was asking, do I have more Google Drive materials to supplement that? Yeah, there could be things like um, assessments, things like uh, activities you could specifically guide the students through. I will warn you that because I've done this for so many decades, I really enjoy not having a set thing I'm gonna do. I really enjoy each year guiding my students through something I've guided them through for decades. And by the way, at one point in the 80s, they got tired of it. And now it's all brand new to them. They haven't seen it. So when you teach long enough, all the old stuff becomes new. Uh, but I will tend to just guide them through spur of the moment to, to lead them down paths I didn't anticipate. But yeah, there are some materials that Again, I can put on the website, or if you go to that principal's website and look at some of those materials, you can see some things that might be helpful. And if not, just ask me and I can probably add some more. Um, the cookies abstraction is, is a good one if, you're, if you've eaten, but if you haven't eaten, it's, it's not a good topic to bring up. 
I definitely use brackets in class, but just like in my APCS A course, I don't require students to use any particular tool. So if a student wanted to use Microsoft WordPad, they do. If a student uses some very elaborate professional tool, that's fine. But I demonstrate text in intro computing just straight in the browser. And I use brackets for my demonstrations in class. But I have towards the end of the year used JS Fiddle. I'll type that in, jsfiddle.net. The .net confuses people because I sometimes forget it and say org or com. But it's jsfiddle.net. It allows you to develop web pages online using a URL that you can then share with anyone, and it's persistent. You can go back years later, and your work is still there. And the presentation link, again, has been put up so expertly. Uh, processing.org is also an excellent site that allows students to use processing to do similar media computation kind of things, as well as other programs. absolutely love the questions, comments, and enthusiasm of this group. I have gone to so many math and computer science conferences, and this day has been probably the best day at any conference I've ever had, just because of the people and the conversations, the quality of the presentations have just blown me away. And let's face it, the support people have been as good as any place I've seen. So kudos to everybody associated with the creation and presentation of this, uh, this workshop. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and thank you to everybody as well and the attendees, um, the presenters, of course, definitely. Uh, and Lynn Diaz, <laughs> the creator of it all. Right, the person I, I whom star. I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't know what computer science principles was had she not brought me in and said, hey, you better know about this thing. And so she was kind of the instigation behind this. She and Owen Astrakhan and uh, Amy Briggs from Middlebury College were uh, incredible at putting this together and, and seeing it through the creation process. Thank oh. you very much, Randy. I appreciated your participation. And it's always great to see Deborah. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to really thank you once again for joining us, um, Mr. Kick. Uh, and it's been wonderful looking at this plan with the frameworks and the fractals. And, you know, I always love anything dealing with math as well. So math is life. So, you know, I, I enjoyed it <laughs> just sitting here being a moderator. Excellent. And let me know if there are more questions. I'll be looking forward to seeing emails or texts or anything that you want to send along a tweet on Twitter if you use Twitter. So hopefully we'll continue these discussions and move computer science education forward in a positive way. Okay. And remember, these sessions have been recorded, so they will be or are being recorded. They will be available on our YouTube page. Leonardo warms my heart. He's going to be playing chaos all night. That is, I have I have spent so many hours doing it, and I love the fact that other people can also get excited about this still. All right. Uh, don't forget, you know, uh, we do have networking opportunities where you can meet some of the other attendees and, and guests and speakers and things like that. So you can, you know, stick around for that as well. Okay. Um, but our time is about up for this session. So did anybody else have any uh, pressing questions or anything like that? So the, the question was for the slides, and I just put the non-shortened version of the slides link. So hopefully that will work. Okay. And then I see, thank you, uh, Myra, for posting the Bitly link as well to the slide yeah, presentation again. Myra. Myra is always helpful and has been doing things for computer science education for years. So thank you, Myra. All right. Well, like I said, we do thank everybody for joining us. Uh, go ahead and stick around for the networking opportunities and be safe out there. And we'll see you for networking. Um, and don't forget, Thanks. come back tomorrow as well. And come back Wednesday as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.